Hello friends and welcome into NFL Daily. I am your host Tom Downey. Some trade buzz, some rumors, the Antonio Brown conspiracy theories, and quite a few injury reports all coming up for you guys on today's show. But we're going to start over in Miami. The fish tank is on and the fish are trying to escape the tank. Uh, Dolphins players reportedly, per Mike Florio Pro Football Talk, have contacted their agents and they want to trade because they don't think the Dolphins are trying to win and they don't want to be part of what is probably going to be a very long season for the Miami Dolphins. Now, the team told Pro Football Talk that they haven't heard anything about that. The floor, uh, the head coach is unaware of it, Brian Flores, haven't heard from the agents or, or the players about this, which, I mean, of course the Dolphins are going to say that, but I did put together some players who could be traded. So I'll mention this again. This is mostly speculation on my part, but uh, some of these players have been mentioned in trade talks before. Devontae Parker actually looked okay in week one, but, you know, it, it is, well, let's just put it gent gently. It is Devontae Parker. Every year is supposed to be the year for him. Now, to Kenyon Drake was linked in the Houston Texans trade talks, but he split time with Kalen Balaj. Charles Harris, the defensive end, he has been very much a bust, so keep that one in mind about what could happen about his future. Rashad Jones and Raekwon Thelen. Look at the, stat, the snap counts from those two in week one. Their snap counts were far lower. Those two don't appear to be a true long-term piece for the Miami Dolphins, and Jones is kind of a big issue there, but I could see McMillan fetching something back in a trade. So we'll see what happens in Miami, but I think come trade deadline time at the worst, there's going to be a full-on fire sale for the fish tank. Now, if you're excited that football is back, well, maybe not so much if you're a Dolphins fan because there's only going to be a handful of wins this year. Like this video for me if you guys are excited. I certainly am. we got two Monday Night Football games coming up. Can't wait to watch them both. It's nice to have football finally back. I know the preseason was here, but that's just, it's not the same. It's just, it's not the same type of thing there. And if you like having football back, Go bet on it, too. Chatsports.com slash bet. Use that promo code NFL120 for a 120% deposit bonus. What that means is, I know math is tough, especially for my good friend Mitch here, but if you put down 50 bucks, they're going to give you 60 for free. Put down 100, they'll give you 120. Again, that is only available at Chatsports.com slash bet. Promo code NFL120. Let's move on to some conspiracy theories. There isn't even really a theory. Did the Patriots and Antonio Brown collude? It's fantasy football season, so we're going to use the word collusion here. Now, Brown did sign a one-year $15 million deal not very long after being released from the Oakland Raiders. And the speed and the timing, it's caused quite a bit of speculation. Especially, we already saw Antonio Brown do this once, right? He just basically embarrassed himself out of Pittsburgh and then did the exact same thing in Oakland when things weren't going his way. He's like, all right, I'm going to throw a hissy fit and force my way out with weird posts on social media, weird behavioral stuff. So did he just want to be a Patriot all along and just maybe went to Oakland for a little bit? Or what I think, maybe he did want to be in Oakland. And then he and Mike Mayock didn't get along. And Antonio Brown's like, well, if I can't have it my way in Oakland, I'm going to leave and go try to do it in New England instead, which is also kind of weird because it's the Belichick system. Probably not quite as much leeway there in the uh, in the Belichick system as there is in the Gruden system out in Oakland. So the Patriots right now all of a sudden receiving core from where we were like two months ago before Josh Gordon came back didn't look that great. Looks actually pretty good right now. Now in terms of what Antonio Brown got in his deal with the New England Patriots, this one, this news just came out a little bit ago. One million base salary, that is fully guaranteed this year. He has a nine million dollar signing bonus. There is also, by the way, a 20 million dollar team option for next year, which A, allows some spacing of the signing bonus for cap purposes. And if the Patriots want to pick him up for $20 million, they can do that. I don't think that would be kind of more of a, of a fake year as far as I'm concerned because $20 million is a lot even for Antonio Brown. But who knows? Maybe they do decide to pick it up. And then you see some incentives there, uh, roster bonuses, which if he's on the active roster, he counts there. And also the NLTBE stands for not likely to be earned incentives that do not count against the cap unless he hits them, in which case they count next year. The 105 catches. 1,298 yards, 16 TDs, all one more than what Antonio Brown had last year. Therefore, doesn't count against the cap. So with all this in mind, 
Did Antonio Brown sabotage himself to get on the Patriots? Type Y for yes, type N for no. It's a no-brainer for me. We saw Antonio Brown do it in Pittsburgh. He busted out the exact same playbook and did it to the Raiders to get himself to New England. I think it's a no-brainer. This is where Antonio Brown wanted to be once things went south in Oakland. He absolutely is a snake, by the way. Bay Area knows their snakes pretty well. Kevin Durant, Antonio Brown now. But let me know what you guys think in the comment section. Why for yes and for no. And while you're down there, let me know your favorite conspiracy theory. Let's have some fun with this one. Your favorite conspiracy theory. If you want to go above and beyond because these are fun for me, go DM me or tweet me on Twitter at WhatGoingDowny. Maybe it's the Denver airport. Maybe it's JFK. Producer Brett loves the Denver airport. <laughs> Message it to me right after I actually say it there. Denver airport is a great one. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section, and please feel free to tweet me there. Maybe it's Sammy Watkins being a, a lizard person. It's a real thing, by the way. Google it. He thinks he is a l lizard person. Great game, though, week one, so it's all fine there in the end. But let me know what you guys think in the comments section. Let's move on now to, unfortunately, the very hefty injury report for week one of the NFL, at least among the more notable players. First up, Nick Foles. He suffered a broken left clavicle, which is the same thing as a car bone, basically. There is no exact timetable here for Nick Foles in terms of when he's going to return, but he's undergone surgery, and he's heading to IR. As a result of the Nick Foles injury, because the Jags' backup quarterback, Beyond Gardner Minshew, was going to be practice squatter Chase Litton, they made a trade. They have dealt for Joshua Dobbs, the quarterback last with the Pittsburgh Steelers, in exchange for a future fifth-round pick. Dobbs is smart. He will pick up the offense incredibly quick, but he's probably just going to be the backup in Jacksonville because it is now the Gardner Minshew era. I'll be honest, I'm excited for it. Gardner Minshew's fun, right? I mean, we're also like barely a year and a half removed from Gardner saying, I'm going to go to Alabama and be basically a, a grad assistant. Instead, he goes to Washington State, gets drafted. Now he's starting in the NFL, and I know it was against the bad Chiefs defense. Minshew was actually really good, you guys. 22-25 for 275, two touchdowns and one interceptions. Now, Yes, I understand that Minshew had a lot of check down passes. His, his average depth of target was second shortest in the NFL last week at just 5.5 yards. But he's accurate. That is really Minshew's game. We saw it at Washington State. If you make life easier on him and don't ask him to be a Patrick Mahomes type gunslinger, which, I mean, who really is? But this is what Minshew can do. Of course, I will make note. It all gets tougher now for Minshew against better defenses and teams that now have a little bit more game film on him. Let's move on now to Tyreek Hill and his injury that it's going to cost them a few weeks. We stick from the Jags game, they play the Chiefs, and Hill was injured in that one. Now, this is not actually the AC joint for Tyreek Hill, which is the normal shoulder collarbone type injury. It's the less common SC joint. I didn't know that was a thing. Of course, I am not a doctor because I am certainly not smart enough for that one. The Chiefs could move Tyreek Hill to IR as we film this right now. No decision has been made yet. He also stayed at the hospital because the injury basically went back into, into his sternum, and the team was concerned that there were some real medical issues there. There was the, if you remember the Danny Amendola injury a couple years ago that was really, really uh, severe, it was like that, although not quite as bad. So Nick Foles out, Tyreek Hill out. Which player is the bigger loss? Give me an N for Nick Foles, a T for Tyreek Hill. Now, I think we're all in agreement here, at least most of us are. Tyreek Hill's the better player, but the bigger loss, unless Gardner Minshew keeps it up like he did last week, I'm going to go with Nick Foles. He's the quarterback. We just saw Sammy Watkins ball out. The Chiefs have some good wide receiver depth. I know Minshew was great, but we also just saw the Jags in on a sixth-round first-year player to be their starting quarterback. So I, I have high hopes for Minshew. But Nick Foles, the starting quarterback, is always going to be more important than the starting wide receiver. Let's stick with a surprisingly common theme here of <laughs> uh, sh shoulder injuries in Week 1. Devin Funches first up here. He also broke his collarbone in Week 1. He has undergone surgery, and he is now heading to I. Are. Now, Funchess, along with Nick Foles, they can both return later this season. NFL teams get two players they can bring off IR, the IR to return move. They don't have to announce which players those are yet, but they can bring them back. In Funchess's absence, the Colts will lean heavily, of course, on T.Y. Hilton. 
Chester Rogers didn't actually play much for the Colts, so that's an interesting move there. Paris Campbell was a little bit slow. Deion Kane, by the way. Do not sleep on Deion Kane if you are in a deep fantasy league or in a dynasty league. I suggest Deion Kane. He's been on my dynasty team since he was drafted. I liked him a lot coming out of Clemson. He makes a lot of sense as a sleeper under the radar pick here for the Colts, but they're not going to have Devin Funchess. That is an unfortunate blow to a Colts team that made a fun comeback effort against the Chargers, right? Let's move on now to the running back position as we move to the ankle injury portion of today's show. Funny how that ended up working out, huh? Coleman suffered a high ankle sprain in week one. Now, he is not going to be placed on IR. Now, IR to, re to return costs you at least eight weeks, sometimes more. Man, how things all work out there. And the high ankle sprain is usually a four to six week injury. Unfortunately for the 49ers, they've spent money on two backs in recent years. Jarek McKinnon and Tevin Coleman. And both are now hurt, which is pretty unfortunate there. In Coleman's absence, it means a bigger workload once again, Matt Breida. The problem is, he didn't look very good in week one. 15 carries for 37 yards. That's not the type of efficiency that I think we have all come to expect out of a Kyle Shanahan offense. And if you get rid of that 13-yard run, which I know you can't really do, but just bear with me here, it's 14 for 24. That's, that's not what you want if you're Matt Breida. Hopefully he is better in week two, especially, of course, if you are a fantasy owner. All right, guys, do you hate watching commercials? If you do, type me in the comments section because uh, especially late in games, Sunday Night Football, Monday Night Football coming up tonight, college football games, I swear they go to so many commercials when they don't need to late in games. It annoys the heck out of me. So if you're done with commercials, go download the My TV Choice app at chatsports.com slash my TV. It'll instead of the same commercials you've seen a hundred times, it'll send you chat sports videos instead. So go get it today. Chatsports.com slash my TV. And yes, it will get you back to the game once it starts. You don't have to worry about missing anything in the actual thing you care about, the game. More running back injuries here. Next up, that is Joe Mixon of the Cincinnati Bengals. He also suffered an ankle injury. The good news is him, his MRI came back all good. He is not going to miss much, if any time. In fact, he could still play in week two. Good news there for the Bengals, who I think surprisingly put up a good fight against the Seattle Seahawks. Now, Mixon wasn't really a big factor in that, though. Six carries for 10 yards. As a dynasty owner of Joe Mixon, that hurt me this week, and I'm sure many of you were impacted by his fantasy performance as well. But for the Bengals, they want him out there. The good news is, if, even if he does miss time, it's not going to be very much. And now on to the Washington Redskins, where Darius Geis, once again, is hurt, unfortunately. He suffered an injury to his other knee, not the one he, he had the MRI, uh, had the ACL tear last year. This is his right knee this time around. It is now a meniscus issue for Darius Geis, and he is likely to miss a few weeks with the hope here for the Redskins, at least, and Geis, of course, too, that he does not need surgery. Good thing the Redskins have a good backup running back, and they do. Adrian Peterson, although I guess it's funny, right? Jay Gruden makes Peterson an active, and then Darius Geis gets hurt, and Adrian Peterson gets, I would assume here, to be the lead back once again in Washington. Of course, you'll see Chris Thompson on third downs. They claimed Wendell Smallwood. He can be a, a part of that offense. But Bryce Love, of course, is, 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 is not starting the year because he's also coming off his own injury at Stanford. And now guys who was going to get to be the guy in Washington is going to miss at least a few weeks here for the Redskins. More bad news for Washington. Producer Alicia not happy about this one. Jonathan Allen suffered an MCL sprain in week one. He is now week to week, and he's going to miss time. Allen is one of, I think, the more underrated players in the NFL. He is a fantastic defensive lineman. The Redskins did a great job of investing in their D-line. Jonathan Allen, they, uh, they drafted Deron Payne early. They extended Matt Iadonis, who played really, really well for the past couple years. But now... You're not going to have Allen in his place. It is set to be Tim Settle, who is really almost a, def a nose tackle with his size, but it's a 3-4 scheme, so it's fine there in the end. The unfortunate part here for, for the Redskins is that 
Timing's not great because they have another divisional rival coming up this week against the Dallas Cowboys, who we know ha have success running the football, though not as much in week one. They aired it out a little bit more. So who do you have in week two, Cowboys or the Redskins? Let me know in the comment section. For me, it's a no-brainer. And I say this as the unbiased host of the Dallas Cowboys report here at Chat Sports. It's the Cowboys. Producer Alicia, who you got? She says Cowboys as well. So we're all in agreement here. Go bet on the Cowboys to beat the Redskins at chatsports.com slash bet and use that promo code NFL120 for a 120% deposit bonus. I said to bet on the Cowboys against the Giants. Go do the same thing now against the Redskins. Again, that 120% deposit bonus, put down 100 bucks. They will give you 124 free to bet with. Free money to bet with from our friends over at BetDSI, only available at chatsports.com slash bet. All right, the last injury note here of the day. I know there were a lot of them, right? It's unfortunate. Chris Lindstrom, the Falcons' first-round pick out of Boston College, a top 15 selection, has suffered a fracture in his foot. There's a small bone that he's fractured in that foot. He is heading to IR, but much like, for example, Deion Jones last year for the Falcons, he is going to be eligible to return this season. But this is a pretty big loss for the Falcons offense line, especially after they didn't look that great in week one. So with Lindstrom out, Jamon Brown, who was listed as the backup to James Carpenter, he's going to slide over to right guard, and he will start in, in Lindstrom's place. Not necessarily the end of the world. Jamon Brown has been a starter in the NFL. Of course, really the entire Falcons team have to up their level there. But unfortunately for Lindstrom, he is going to miss at least most of the season, potentially the entire year as he recovers from that fractured foot.